over to our uh, instructor. So thank you. And Tim and Mandy, I'm now recording. So go ahead. You can start the class. Tim, I think you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's class, the Windsor Newton Watercolors Be Kind Wreath Wall Art. My name is Tim DePack, and I am from Windsor Newton, and I'll be your moderator today. I'm being joined by Mandy Peltier, who will be your artist instructor for this class. And Mandy will be taking you through today's class by providing information about the products that are being used. She'll be showing you some of her favorite tech watercolor painting techniques and creating this beautiful Be Kind Wreath Wall Art by Windsor Newton Watercolor Paints by using the Sketcher Pocket Box set. Uh, if you've heard what Kelly said previously before that, that the class will be uh, recorded and available 24 hours later to replay and watch it. There was also a link that was provided on the booking sign up that would be the sketched part beforehand. Hopefully you all had a chance to get an opportunity to print that out and, and start the project along with that. If not, we'll put the link in the chat on the side for you to download that there as well. And uh, with that being said, uh, I'd like to hand it over to Mandy. All right, well, thank you, Tim. And hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be back with another class. I recognize a lot of the names in the audience, so it's great to see you all again. And um, it's fun, some of you are putting in the chat where you're from, so that's really cool to see that you're all over the United States and some other countries as well. So welcome wherever you are. I hope the weather is beautiful wherever you are, or I hope it will be beautiful soon if it's not beautiful today. So we only have an hour, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my other camera so we can get started. All right, so I always start with an overhead view so we can just go over the supplies so you can make sure you have everything you need. The very first thing I'm gonna point out is this little stencil here on this sheet of paper. This is very similar to what we used in my last class, which was Mother's Day cards, where we're going to fold along the dashed line and cut out the outline. And this is just the outline of the B that's on the wreath and it will just make it easier for us to line it up, center it and make sure it's proportional and symmetrical on both sides. So if you haven't printed this out yet, go ahead and do that now while I kind of go over the other supplies. But if you've already transferred the outline prior to the class, or if you just want to freehand draw the B, that's fine too. This is just for those of us who want it to be perfectly symmetrical and a little bit easier. All right, so let me talk about the project here. This is the project we're making today. It's a be kind wreath, sort of a play on words. You can do the text, whatever you want. It doesn't have to say kind. You could put be brave or be bold or be you, whatever you want. Uh, but I think whatever you put on this, it could be just a great reminder before you walk out of your door to go out there and be whatever you put on the wreath. So we could all use kindness. I know that for sure. Uh, but whatever word you decide to use is, is okie dokie. All right. So the other supplies we're going to use, I'm once again going to be using the Skechers pocket box set. This is the set I've used for all of my watercolor classes so far this year. And while it's only a 12 piece set, I hope you've learned along with me how versatile this set is and how many colors you can create from it. And today will be no exception to that. And I always use paper towels when I'm working with watercolor. The pair of scissors is only for this outline here. Uh, we're gonna use the scissors to cut it out. So if you're not using this today, then you don't need scissors, but otherwise scissors are gonna come in handy <laughs> to cut it out. And then we'll be using an artist palette that has individual wells. I know some artists like to use a flat artist palette where you just sort of mix the paint on a flat surface. In my classes, I really like to use the artist palette that have individual wells because I think it equals the playing field for all of us and it makes it easier for you to mimic what I'm doing on camera and to have the same successful results uh, by me telling you and showing you exactly how to mix the colors and how much water and all of that. So, and we'll be using 140 pound cold pressed watercolor paper today. Two round brushes and number four and number two, I'm using the Cotman brushes and then a graphite pencil and eraser just to sketch the outline with and a glass of water, which, you know, is sort of obvious if you're using watercolor paint. So I'm going to go ahead and set everything aside for now and we're going to sketch the outline. The outline I think is easy to draw, but there's a lot to it. <laughs> so it's going to take us a minute to sketch this. So I'm going to place everything aside, like I said, except for the watercolor paper my eraser, my pencil, and I'm going to pull in the actual outline that was provided as a download for this class. I think it's a little bit easier to draw the outline if you have it right next to you and you can see it side by side. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just make a few dashes. I'm gonna make like a square. 
So I can just sort of outline where the circle needs to be for the wreath. And I'm just gonna draw like a, a loose circle. So the left and right side of the circle is about an inch in on each side of the paper. So I'm just using my graphite pencil and I'm just gonna draw a little dash on the left side, a little dash on the right side. And then top to bottom, it's about two inches down on the top and it's about two inches from the bottom. And then that just sort of gives me a framework to sort of draw a loose circle. I believe when I initially did this, I used like a cereal bowl and I just traced around the cereal bowl. So you can do that. Or if you happen to have a big uh, stencil, you can use the stencil too, a big circle stencil, but the circle doesn't have to be perfectly symmetrical. It could even be a slight oval shape because we're going to be drawing all of these leaves and buds and flowers, and it's going to make it not perfect looking. So if you're wondering what kind of flower we're painting today, these are not daisies. They're not sunflowers. This is actually chamomile. And the leaves of a chamomile flower, I think kind of look like dill. So they're pretty simple. There's no veins on the leaves. They're just kind of curved lines. So we're going to start by drawing the chamomile flowers. We'll stop. We'll start with this uh, front facing view. And I'll start with this one here that's sort of upper right. And I'll start by drawing a circle for the center of that chamomile flower. And then I'm just going to go all the way around and I'm going to just draw on as many petals as I can fit. I like to rotate my work as I go. So I'm kind of drawing all of the petals from the same angle or starting point. It just sort of helps me maintain control. You don't have to do this. If you are really good at drawing basic flowers like this without rotating, then by all means do what works best for you. I am using um, an F graphite pencil today. I normally don't use uh, an F graphite pencil. I normally use an H pencil, like a 4H to a 6H. I'm gonna draw this one down here now, lower left. Um, but I'm using an F pencil so that the graphite is a little bit darker so you can see it better at home. I get this question a lot in my classes. Are you going to erase the graphite lines when you're done? And the answer is the reason why I use H pencils is the graphite is a really light color and it's a very firm lead. So it's so light that when I'm done painting, I can't even see it beneath my watercolor paint. So there's really no need to erase it. Um, so that's why I use H pencils, but so that you can see it at home today, I am using uh, an F pencil. All right, so now let's do these side view chamomile flowers. I'm gonna start by drawing the center of it and it kind of looks like a gumdrop shape. And I'm just gonna follow along with what I see on my outline. And I'm gonna start by drawing kind of two sideways petals. And then I'm just gonna fit in whatever I can underneath. And then I'll draw the other one over here. And that center that kind of looks like a gumball kind of goes in the other direction of the one we just drew, but it still has those sort of two side petals. And then I'll sort of fan out the petals that go underneath. And I'm just fitting on as many as I can. I'm not necessarily fitting on the exact number I see on the outline. And then I'll draw these sort of small, partially opened chamomile flowers. And it's just a fan shape. I'm just going to draw five smaller petals that sort of all together look like a handheld fan. And there's one at the top and there's one at the bottom. They go in opposite directions. One has petals that go to the right and one has petals that go to the left. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw on all of these chamomile uh, leaves. I'm going to hold off on the buds for a second. Mandy, so I'm before just, you do that, can you hold that yeah. up a little bit so that so everybody can get a good view of that? Because yeah, it's, sure. it's a little lighter on the screen today. So, all right. So everybody can see that there, how she's doing that. So, I'm just literally copying what I see on my outline here. So, hopefully, you can still see this outline. And I'm just placing everything where approximately where I see it. I'm not trying to be exact today, I'm just trying to be approximate. My chamomile flowers, the front facing ones are actually a little bit bigger than they are on the outline, but that's okay. So I'm just going to go around now and I'm just going to draw these little curved lines and some are going to connect onto themselves. Some are going to be their own little branch with leaves. I'm just very loosely following what I see on my outline here. And I'm just drawing these little curved lines. Some have just two leaves. Some have three. Uh, you can add as many or as few as you want. There's no wrong way to do this. 
Uh, we just are, you could even paint some on freehand when we get to the por portion of the project where we paint on these leaves. Uh, so just remember, we're just drawing curved lines. To, uh, just think of dill. When you think of a dill plant or even like a fennel plant, these are the sort of leaves that are on a chamomile flower. And I'm really excited about this project because I'm a really big gardener and I'm kind of like an earthy natural kind of person. And so I'm growing chamomile in my garden and I like to use it for soap making and for tea and for like lotion. So I love it when we do projects that really resonate with me and uh, reflect my own interests. So I hope you guys have as much fun painting this as, as I have had. All right, so I'm working my way around here. Again, just using my outline as just a loose guide for where to place my chamomile petals and how many. And then the very last thing I'm gonna do on the wreath part is do those little buds. And there's one, two, three, four buds. They're kind of on each part of the, the wreath and they just look like teardrops. So I'm just gonna draw like a, a little stem for it and then that teardrop shape and then I'll do this one. This one sort of goes south and then do that teardrop shape. And then I have one here. And then I have one up here. I might just do it off of that one here. All right, so there's our little wreath. And now it's the time to cut out our B. So I'm gonna fold along that dashed line. And you can see the B is facing up or half of the B at this point is facing up. So I know where to cut. <laughs> and then I'm gonna grab my pair of scissors. I have a real pair of scissors today. I'm not using my sewing scissors today that I used last time. And I'm gonna just roughly cut a square around the B to make it a little bit easier to cut out the actual outline. Since it's so small for a, little, for a huge sheet of uh, printer paper. And I am just using regular old printer paper you could print this on cardstock if you want it to be a little bit easier to trace around, um, but I'm just using as cheap as you can find printer paper today. And then I'll just have to be careful with my non-dominant hand to just hold it down so that it doesn't shift when I'm tracing around it with my dominant hand. And then there still will be some little detail work we'll have to do to the B, but this will at least make sure the outline of it is symmetrical. All right, so I'm almost done here. As you're doing that, Mandy, we'll just let everybody know that the class is being recorded and will be available 24 to 48 hours after the conclusion of the class. So if some people are trying to play catch up or you want to just sit back and relax and watch as Mandy performs this and you want to come back at a later time to do it, it will be available within 24 to 48 hours. And we'll put the post where you can find it on the chat on the side over there for you to see. Thank you, Tim. Yes, I try to squeeze in as much as I can into my classes. Sometimes it's ambitious. So please feel free to rewatch and pause as needed so you can better keep up. Also, another thing is I like to provide written directions for all of my classes. So I'm just going to unfold this and just center it towards the top, center top middle of the paper. And I'm going to hold it down with my non-dominant hand and trace around it. But I firmly believe that we all learn in different ways and I don't want any of us to feel left out. So I really like to provide written instructions so it can be easier for everyone to follow along. Even when this class is over, like when this is done today, if you want to redo it, you can have the written directions to help you be successful at that or to use the written directions along with the video uh, to help you follow along. All right, so I'm just tracing around the whole B. I'm kind of shifting my non-dominant hand to help my dominant hand trace around it successfully here. All right, and there we go. So I wanna to touch this part up here. And the first thing I wanna do is I wanna just draw a line to differentiate the top wing and bottom wing on both sides of the B. So I'm just going to sort of start at this curve and then pull it in and then do it on the other side. So I'm just drawing the bottom wing where it is. And then at the top of the B, I'll draw a curved line that sort of goes up to designate where his head is. And then I'll do both antennas. So some of this we want to try and get symmetrical, but it's okay if it's not perfect today. I am not being as fussy with my outline as I normally would be. All right, and then I'll go ahead and draw his two top uh, legs or arms on each side of the head here. And then it has real skinny 
legs coming out, just kind of like the antenna. And then I'm going to draw a curved line to connect to the bottom of the B on both sides. And then sort of two thirds of a triangle to designate the top of the B from the bottom of the B. So I just sort of drew a curved line and then brought it down to a point. And then I just have two more curved lines for the top to, to create those stripes. So I'm gonna draw one right above that two thirds of a triangle point that sort of goes in a downward motion. And then above it, I'll do one that goes sort of in an upward motion. And then that will create his head and then three top stripes. And then at the bottom of the B, the first stripe is sort of a wavy line. So I'm gonna draw that one in and then two just curved lines that sort of point down. And if you mess up, use that eraser. I'm going to fix mine up here. And if you need to extend the very bottom of the B, you can do that. I'm going to do that to mine. So my stripes are a little bit wider. All right. And then we have his legs at the bottom. So there's two legs on each side of the B. I think of these as two triangles that sort of meet at each other's point. So I'm going to draw one triangle and then I'm going to draw another triangle off of that one and then his little leg. And then I'm going to do that again with a little leg and then I'm going to do it on the other side. So again, I'm just using my outline as an example for placement and to know what to draw. Sketching takes practice. Uh, if you find it easier to sketch the outline before class, please do that. I know it can feel a little overwhelming to try and keep up with me, um, but I try not to have half of the class time spent just drawing the outline. So that's why I move quick. And then the last thing we need to do is draw these little patterns on the wings. I'm gonna hold this up for a second. So the bottom wings are basically just two sets of parallel kind of curvy lines. And then the bottom line just has sort of a smaller line that sort of goes down off in an angle. So I'll start with my bottom wings and just kind of draw two kind of wavy parallel lines. And on the very bottom one, I'm just gonna draw a smaller line that goes at an angle. And then the top wing is maybe a little bit fancier. I'm kind of drawing, a, I guess, a rounded line that meets the body and then another rounded line underneath and then a line that connects the two. So it's just three lines. The first one kind of goes towards the top of the wing. And then there's another one that goes down towards the bottom of the wing. And then I just draw one curved line to connect the bottom to the top. But you can do whatever you want. You can just do curved lines if you want, like we did on the bottom wing. You can do whatever you want. It doesn't have to be exactly like what I have on mine. This is your project, make it your own. All right. And then the last thing we have to do before we're gonna mix our colors is write our lettering. So I'm gonna go with kind because that's the example we have today for the class, but you can write whatever you want. And so I'm gonna start my K over here. And if I need to make some adjustments to my lettering, I certainly can with my eraser. And I'm just gonna sort of following, I'm gonna follow the letter example I have here, but you can use your own handwriting if you want. If you don't like the, the font that's provided on the outline, you can do your own thing with it. All right, so there's our, our outline, our little sketch. So I'm gonna put this aside for now because we're gonna mix our colors. When I practice this class, I practiced mixing as we go and I practice mixing everything at once. And I think for this particular project, it's just a little bit easier to mix them all at once and then we can just use the rest of the class time to paint. So. We're going to mix seven colors and we're going to mix one wash. We're going to start by mixing the seven colors. So grab your number four round brush. And if you've taken my classes before, this will be like riding a bike. We're going to stick our brush in the water and we're going to give it a stir to help those bristles evenly absorb the water. And I like to use my brushes as if they're spoons. And I'm going to place a couple scoops of water into seven different wells on my palette. So by scoop, I literally mean you're just going to take your brush like it's a spoon and go one, two, and you're going to do that to seven wells on your palette. And this will just give us clean water to mix our color into. And since we're working with dry half pans, it'll give us something to activate the paint color with. 
So we're going to mix our seven colors first, and then we'll mix our wash because I don't want you to get confused which, with which well has the water for the wash and which one has water for the, the actual paint colors. So we'll start with the seven paint colors and then do the wash. And we're going to start by using our white, our Chinese white. It's the white that's in your set. And then to the first well of your palette that has two scoops of water into it, I'm going to do four or so passes of color into that well. When I say pass, I mean, you're going to take your wet brush. You're going to just run it into that paint a handful of times. I'm not using dainty pressure. And then I'm going to stir it into that well with two scoops of water. I'm going to run my brush on the edge of that palette to release excess paint. And that's one pass. So I'm going to repeat that process three to four times uh, until you have maybe slightly more paint to water ratio. With this particular project, we're not really layering color. We are in a few areas, but as a whole, a lot of areas are only going to receive one application of paint or one layer of paint. So I want to make sure that my paint is super pigmented. And one way we can do that is to make sure it's a little more paint than it is water. All right. And then rinse your brush. And this is where I use my paper towel. I like to kind of dab it on my paper towel to help get rid of excess water. And we're going to mix black into our next well. So we're going to have a white well and then a black well, and then we'll mix our other colors. So if you've taken my other classes before, uh, I've shown you a few different ways to mix black. I kind of decide how I want to mix black based on what other colors I'm using in my palette. And then I choose a black that uses those same colors. So because we're going to use an intense blue as our wash today, I'm going to mix black using intense blue. And so we're going to use intense blue and cadmium red pale hue. So these are two colors that are opposite on the color wheel, blue and orange. And when you mix two complementary colors together, it creates a neutral color like a gray. But it just so happens that these two colors in this set create such a dark gray that it looks black. So I'm going to start by doing two passes of the cadmium red pale hue and stirring that into those two scoops of water into the next well on your palette. And then intense blue, it is very appropriately named because it is intense. And I think of all the colors in this set, it is the most pigmented or it's the easiest to pull pigment from. So rinse your brush dab it on your paper towel and just do one pass of intense blue to start with. And you'll see that it's very influential. <laughs> you may only need one pass of the intense blue to turn it black. Um, if yours looks a little midnight blue or just like a really deep dark blue, then what you'll want to do is rinse your brush and add a bit more orange to it. So if it's a little on the orange side, you'll want to add more blue. If it's a little on the blue side, you'll want to add more orange. You'll want to keep fussing with it uh, until you have what looks like black, until they totally neutralize each other out. And I achieved black super fast today. I actually think I need it to thicken it up just a bit. So I'm going to just play around with it for a second here just to add a bit more pigment to that well. And I think I'm there. All right. That's the fastest I've ever done that. Sometimes it, it takes a little playing around and some back and forth to get it just right. So after you've mixed your black, thing, Mandy, with, with the palette color that you have on there, your, your colors combinations are endless that you can make with this set. So it's, it's really yes. amazing how you can just do some mixing. They absolutely are like, don't be intimidated by such a small, or don't, don't pass up on such a small palette because it only has 12 colors. It has all the colors you need to, to make an endless number of colors. Um, and it will teach you color theory as well, which I think every artist should learn. It will really help you become a better artist. So, um, all right. So rinse your brush dab it on your paper towel. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to take a little bit of the black, put it on your brush and then stir it into the next well on your palette. And we're going to use that to make a light gray. So make sure you clean your brush in between each pass, but I'm going to add Chinese white to that gray. I'm going to rinse, dab on my paper towel, do another pass of white. And I'm probably going to do four or so passes of white into this well, because I want a really light gray color. This is going to be a shadow color on our chamomile petals, but we're also going to be using it on the B. So uh, make a really nice light gray. I'll hold mine up so you can see. So there's quite a juxtaposition between those really dark, really it's gray, but it looks black and then this light gray color. So we just took a little bit of the black and we added enough white to it until we had a really nice soft, like the popular color for walls right now, like repose gray. It's going to be a really light kind of gray color. 
All right, and then the next color, the next ones are easy because it's pretty much just one color here. All right, so the next one, we're only going to mix cadmium yellow. Cadmium yellow is your darkest yellow on the top row. And we're gonna do four to five passes into the next well of our palette, depending on your pressure. We just want it to be really pigmented, a little more paint than water today. So don't use dainty pressure as you run your brush into the paint, really uh, run it into that half pan so you can pull out the pigment. And then don't rinse your brush because the next well of our palette is gonna be burnt sienna, but the little bit of yellow that's still on our brush, I love what it does to the burnt sienna color. It just makes it a little more vibrant. So I'm just gonna use my already wet brush that still has cadmium yellow on it. And I'm gonna go ahead and do four to five passes into the next well on my palette. And by the time we're done mixing burnt sienna into this well, there's not going to be any cad yellow left on that half pan of burnt sienna. But it just makes it a little bit brighter. All right. And then two more colors to go. There are colors that we're going to use on the leaves. The first one is just going to be sap green. Sap green is the lighter green that's on the bottom row of your palette. It's the one that looks a little bit like an avocado or apple green. And we're going to do four to five passes of that color. Again, make it nice and pigmented because the leaves are only getting one application of color. We're not layering the leaves or the stems. So make it nice and pigmented. And then the next one, the seventh well on your palette, or this is the sixth, no seventh, because the white blends in. Oh my word, it blends in. So you'll have to remember which one you put white in so you don't accidentally add another color. We're gonna start by adding another four to five layers of sap green into the seventh well on your palette. And we're gonna darken it a little bit by adding another scoop of the black, but we'll do that after we get the sap green in there. All right, so the same amount of sap green as you did the sixth well in your palette. And then you can clean your brush, dab it on your paper towel, and then just put a little bit of black on your brush and stir it into the sap green. And then it will give you a lighter sap green and then a darker sap green. And I think I want just a little bit more black in mine. Amanda, I'm just gonna let everybody know as you're doing that, when you go back in and watch the replay, everyone, you'll have the directions on there as well. So if you need to get back to this point of the mixing, the information is there on the instructions, along with Mandy speaking again on the replay when you're mixing these colors to help you out. Yes, absolutely. But hopefully with me telling you exactly how many scoops and passes you'll be able to mimic what I've done here and make it easier for you to uh, replicate what I'm doing. So the very last uh, thing we're gonna do before we start painting is mixing our wash color. So into a new well on your palette and with a clean brush, place five scoops of water into a well on your palette. If it's more than five, that's okay. We just, we want it to be watery, watery, watery. And then I had mentioned, we're gonna make our wash using the intense blue. I'm telling you this intense blue is very pigmented. So while I've said, don't use dainty pressure, now we're gonna use dainty pressure. <laughs> so I'm gonna use just light pressure and I'm just gonna run it over my intense blue for just a second and then stir it in and look how bright that is with just like a little second of running your brush gently over the intense blue. It kind of gives it an ocean blue color, maybe a sky blue color. But if, if you, I'll show you what it looks like if you accidentally use too much pressure, it makes it, okay. So if I were to do just a normal pass into the intense blue, look what it does to the wash. I mean, look how big of a difference that is. So you'll want to use really light pressure. And if you accidentally put too much in the well, uh, just add more water until it looks like this one where it's more of a wash. And yes, I'm using a ceramic palette. I see that question, I am. I love ceramic palettes. I think they're easier to clean, they don't stain. The colors don't bleed over into other wells. Like I've had an issue with, with some plastic palettes. So yeah, if you, if you can get a ceramic palette, I recommend that. All right, so we are ready to start painting. Hang on to your number four brush. I'm going to put my Skechers pocket box set aside because we have all our colors mixed. So unless I need to remix a color, which is possible, it could happen. Um, I, I'm done with the Skechers pocket box set. So I'm going to Andy, pull Can over. you hold the finished piece up? There you go. For everybody yeah. wants to see that first. Perfect. All right. And then grab your number two brush as well, because the very first step, we're going to be working with both brushes. We're going to be using one brush for the white paint and one brush for the light gray paint. So I'm actually going to turn my palette so I can work between those two colors. So we haven't used our number two yet. So I'm gonna give it a stir in the water 
to help those bristles absorb the water. I'm going to dab it on my paper towel. I'm also going to clean my four again, just in case there's any of that intense blue still on there. All right, so what we're going to do with the number four is we're going to add white to every single chamomile petal, including the buds. And then we're going to use the gray to add some folds in the petal or some, um, some veins, I guess, if you will. So some shadowed areas to create some form. So I'm going to put some, uh, some white on my number four. And we're just going to work one chamomile petal or flower at a time. So let's start with this upper right front facing chamomile. And I'm going to use my four and I'm just going to add white to every single petal. And we mixed white first so that we wouldn't accidentally turn it gray or blue from mixing the other colors. So that's why we mixed white first thing so that it could actually stay white. And even the Chinese white in the uh, Cotman Skechers pocket box set even has some color to it. Um, I love it. It's like a nice soft kind of white. So I'm just applying it to every single petal on this first chamomile flower. And then what I'm going to do is while it's all still wet and sort of setting into the paper, I'm going to use a technique that we're going to build upon in my next few classes. And I'll show you that here in a second, but I want to show you this first. All right, so you're gonna take your number two round brush, you're gonna stick it in your gray paint, and you're just gonna you're gonna place a dot at the base of maybe working with four petals at a time. All right, so you're just placing a dot of the light gray, and then I'm going to just dab what's left on my brush on my paper towel so I don't have too much gray on my brush. And then starting at the bottom of the petal, I'm just gonna pull upward with it to create some folds on that petal. And it will really concentrate at the bottom, which creates shadow at the base of the petal, which would be very realistic for an actual uh, chamomile flower, but then it also creates uh, some folds along the petal itself. And then once I do four, I'm gonna dot on maybe enough for four more petals, dot or dab my brush on the paper towel, and then I'm just gonna do a few more folds on those petals. So I'm just pulling from that puddle, if you will. So what this will do is it will prevent us from accidentally making the petals gray, they'll stay white. It'll just create some form and some depth. And that's also why I dab my brush after I put these little dots at the base of the petal. That's also why I dab my brush on the paper towel so that I'm not working with too much of the light gray color and then accidentally turn uh, one of the petals completely gray. Andy, can you do the finish piece up a little bit in the corner when you're done yes. with that too? It's hard to see because they're really light colors. This is a subtle technique. So I can hold this one up. And if I hold my finished one up, you might be able to see a little bit better. Now the finished one does have some of the intense blue wash on it. Um, and we'll do that at the very end. Um, but you'll see how it just creates some delicate folds in the petal. And um, while you guys are doing that to the first one, I just want to, I mentioned that a lot of the techniques we're using on this class today, we're going to build upon and we're going to use those in my future classes. And then those classes will also teach some new techniques that we'll build upon. And it's going to culminate in a class I'm teaching in June that I think today is my hardest as far as uh, technical level. Uh, but if you take this class and my classes to come, I think you'll be ready to, to accomplish it. So I just want to show you these real quick. This coming Tuesday. So just a few days from now, I'll be teaching this class, red, white, and blue anemones. And we'll use some of the techniques we're using today on these. We'll also learn a couple new techniques. And then June 22nd, I'm teaching this red, white, and blue popsicle. All of these you can sign up for now on the Michael store uh, online classes page. They're all live. You can sign up for them. This one uses a wipe technique uh, that will be really good for you to learn because we're going to use the wipe technique as well as some of the things we'll learn today and in Tuesday's class to culminate in learning how to paint this red hibiscus. So this red hibiscus uses a lot of different techniques. It's probably the most realistic piece I've taught to date and most challenging, but we're slowly working up to it. So if you take this class in my future classes, you'll be ready to go with the hibiscus. All right, so. I dropped all those links in the uh, chat right now for people. Perfect, to see. thank you, Tim, I appreciate it. All right. And they're so also now, available on your class as well. So people look at the, up in the corner, connect with Mandy on her pages on Instagram and her website. You can get notified of the classes that she's done as well. Just yes, thank you for, thanks for pointing that out. Yes. I always forget you can follow me on social media and I, I love it when you share your work with me. I just, it makes my day. All right. But I'll talk more about that later too. Okay. So I'm going to take some more white and I'm going to paint on the bud 
And then same thing, I'm gonna take my two, put it in the light gray, dot that at the base, and then just do even a few shadow folds even on the petal itself or bud itself. And then I'm going to, with my number four, paint white onto the side view chamomile. So I use four for the white, two for the gray. And then while the paint is still wet, just sort of switch back and forth here. It's almost like you're cutting someone's hair and one hand you're holding the comb and the other hand you're holding the scissors and just working back and forth between them. And then I'm just gonna use my two to paint on some soft folds onto the petals. And uh, if your gray is really, really dark and you think it's going on too dark, just add more white to your paint to make it the light gray. And we're just working our way around to every single chamomile bud and petal. And this step could be repeated if you wanted, um, but we have a lot to do today. So I'm only doing this one time. If you wanted to add, you know, a few more dark folds, but we are gonna use the intense blue wash on the petals as well to further add some dimension to them. So this is a quick paint, but then we also do some more advanced techniques too with layering. Kind of introduces you to both. Right. And again, if you're having a hard time keeping up today, don't fret, just enjoy the process and the learning. And uh, you can always rewatch this class. And if you go to my website, mandypeltier.com, you can even, um, you go to the Michaels Store YouTube channel as well, but I have a page on my website where I just have a direct link to everything uh, where you can see all the prior classes I've taught and download the outline and the written instructions and the YouTube link to view the class. So you can sort of get caught up on some of the other classes I've taught and the techniques I've taught. If you've been wanting to learn about color theory, the last class I taught, that Mother's Day card class, really dive deep into color theory a bit more than some of my other classes have and how to mix colors using this Skechers pocket box set. Um, so that's one you could, could do. But I've lost count of how many classes I've taught, but I've taught quite a few. So I think there's a project for everyone from beginner to, to more uh, intermediate advanced. And of course, when we're done today, my favorite, favorite, favorite thing is when I see the finished work that all of you created. Um, I get regular emails from some of you after each class and you show me your work and I just love it. It makes my day. I feel like some of you are just becoming friends. Um, so tag me on social media, my um, username slash handle across all of social media is Mandy Peltier Artist. So you can find me there on Instagram and on Facebook and a few other places. And tag me in your post so I can see it. Follow me so you can keep up to date on what's coming up. There was a video that was just loaded yesterday on YouTube of a watermelon how-to. You might just recognize the hands in that video. So you can go check that out. That'll give you a fun, easy summer project to do. Watermelons. So I actually need a little more white into mine to finish off here. Someone just found your hibiscus on there as well. On the oh. Website. That's the June 25th class that's on there. I just put the link for people to see that one as well. Perfect. Yes. And my two June classes are also back to back classes. I'm doing uh, two months of back to back classes. So that red, white and blue popsicle is a Tuesday. And then the hibiscus is a Friday class like today. Same time. All right. So unless I missed something, I think I got every single chamomile petal and bud. So now we're going to paint on the B. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to place our four aside. We're done with our four. I'm going to thoroughly clean my number two brush going to dab it on my paper towel and then I'm going to move my water because we're not going to use the water for just a little bit and I don't want to be tempted to accidentally stick my brush in there because that can be just habit to do that. Um, so we're going to be working in between the light gray and the black and we're just going to be using the tip of our brush to move back and forth between them. So by just using the tip of our brush we're not going to turn the light gray black and we're not going to turn the black light gray 
but by kind of working in between the two colors, we can kind of create a third color, like a dark gray. So, and that will prevent us from having to mix a dark gray color. We can just work between the two. So I'm using the number two round brush and just make sure it's nice and clean and you've dabbed it on your paper towel. And we're gonna start by loading up our brush with black. So go ahead and put black on your brush and we're gonna paint on his antennas. Um, you may find for this really fine line work that a zero may work better for you. So it's okay if you want to use a zero. Um, I'm just going to stick with my two here and we're going to use black to paint that on. And I'm going to paint on his head as well. Just using the black. All right. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to dip just the tip of my brush into the light gray. So the light gray is going to mingle with the black that's still on your brush. And I'm going to paint on his top. I want to call them arms, but they're not arms, the top of his legs. So you see how it makes it like a dark gray compared to the other color. So paint on both of the base of those arms. And then I'm going to dip my brush back in the black and I'm going to paint on the skinny part of those legs along the top. Okay. So that's just a soft introduction to what we're going to do on the wings and the legs. All right. So I just wanted to introduce that really quick. So go ahead because we're going to do that again in a second. So go ahead and rinse your number two brush, dab it on your paper towel, and we'll go ahead and do all of the yellow stripes before we return and paint on the rest of the black on the B. So it's just a little introduction there. All right, so with the yellow stripes, we're gonna use the cadmium yellow and the burnt sienna. I'm going to load up the cadmium yellow on my number two brush. And the stroke we're gonna use is called a hatching stroke. So you're basically lifting your brush in between each stroke. I've used this stroke before in some of my other classes, but how it looks is like this. You're just running your brush, lifting. You're just making little small strokes and you're lifting your brush in between each stroke. So I'll hold that up so you can see. All right, so I'm not using like a back and forth stroke. I'm lifting my brush in between each individual stroke. And so the top stripe that doesn't have any color on it yet, I'm gonna use that hatching stroke and I'm gonna hatch on that cadmium yellow to the whole stripe. Okay, and it's okay if there's a little bit of negative space still showing and by negative space, I mean the tooth of the paper. And then you can quickly rinse your brush, dab it on your paper towel. And then I'm gonna put some of that burnt sienna on my brush. And I'm going to dab that along the top edge and the side edges. And by dab, I just mean I'm going to place my brush and I'm just going to dab it on the paper. I'm just placing it down and lifting. So I'm not pulling it. I'm not moving it back and forth. I'm just dabbing it. So I'm going to dab this color along the top edge and along the sides. And we're just going to let it organically blend and merge into the cadmium yellow that we already applied. And we're going to essentially repeat this process to all the other yellow stripes. So the next yellow stripe is the one that sort of looks like a triangle and I'm going to hatch on cadmium yellow to that one. Okay, then I'll swish dab. And on this one, I think I'll just apply burnt sienna along the top edge by dabbing it on. Amanda, just to let you know, we're about 1.45 my time here. So 15 minutes to the top of the hour, just to give Ooh. you a time check. It's going so fast today. All right, so go ahead and paint on both of the other yellow stripes. I'm just gonna go ahead, they're really small and skinny. So I'm gonna go ahead and do cad yellow to both of them. Then I'll swish my brush, dab it on a paper towel. And then once again, burnt sienna along the upper edge of each of these stripes. And this is also a step that you could repeat if you wanted. Um, today, I'm only gonna do it one time and you don't have to redo it, but if you wanted to, you could redo it a second time just to add more intensity. All right, so once you're done painting on the yellow stripes, I wanna paint on the pattern that's on the wings using the light gray color. So I'm gonna put light gray on my brush and I'm just going to literally go over the pattern that's on the top wing and the bottom wing on each side of the bee. And then we're gonna use a technique in just a little bit where we're gonna do a whole entire wash over the wings. 
that's going to soften, but not completely eliminate the pattern that we're now painting on. And this is a technique we'll be using on that hibiscus to kind of soften some of the, the folds and the veins on those hibiscus petals without actually eliminating everything we did until that point. And then I'm going to stick my brush. I'm going to move my water aside. And I'm going to stick my brush in the black, just the tip of it. And I'm going to paint on the top edge of the top wing. And I'm going to paint on the top edge of the other wing. And I'm going to do the same to the bottom wings the top edge of the bottom wing. If you need to add more paint to your brush, just work back and forth between the gray and the black. So if you had picked up black, pick up gray next time. So just work back and forth between them. So it's more of a dark gray. Okay, and then we're gonna let this sort of set for a second while we paint on the black stripes on the B. Okay, all right, so black stripes on the B Place your brush in the light gray, just the tip of it, and hatch that on to the top black stripe that doesn't yet have color. Then place your tip, the tip of your brush into the black and dab that on along the upper edge of that stripe and along the sides, just like we did with the yellow. And this will kind of create a nice gradient of color so it's not just solid black. There's a few different colors going on. And uh, if that Mine kind of turned out to be a dark gray, so I'm just dabbing on a little more solid black along the topper edge. I think I said topper edge, I'm a top edge. <laughs> All right, and then for the next stripe, I'm gonna place the tip of my brush into the light gray and hatch that on. Oh, that's a nice dark gray color there. And then tip of my brush into the black and I'm gonna dab that on along the upper edge. So we're just working back and forth between the black and the light gray and I'm gonna, Place my brush into the light gray, paint on this last stripe here, and then black, dab on along the top edge. And I like a looser bee, so I'm gonna let all these colors bleed into each other as they want, all right? I'm not gonna try and fuss with them or manipulate it too much. And then let's paint on the, the legs on the sides of the bee. So we're gonna keep just working back and forth between the black and the gray. I most recently put black on my brush, so I'm gonna put the tip of my brush into the light gray, and these bottom triangles on the legs on one side of the B, I'm going to paint on both of those bottom triangles. So it's like a dark gray. Okay. And then I'm going to place the tip of my brush into the black. And then I'm going to paint on what's left of those legs, including that skinny little thing at the bottom. So that way we have dark gray, or sorry, we have black, dark gray, and then black again. And then I'll do the same to the other side. So black was most recently on my brush. So the tip of it into the light gray, I'm gonna paint on the bottom triangle on those legs, tip of the brush into the black, paint those on as well as his little legs. I think it's a fun way to paint a bee. All right, and now we can thoroughly rinse our brush. So we're gonna do that wash on the wings I was telling you about. And then we're also gonna drop in some of the intense blue wash to add a slight blue cast. So wet your, clean your brush. And then let's just wipe it on the edge of our water glass a few times, cause we still want a little bit of water on the brush so that this technique works. I'm gonna turn mine to the side so I can work a little bit easier. And I'm gonna take my wet brush and to the top half of one wing, I'm gonna wet the whole thing with this clean water. And I'm gonna add more water to my brush if I need to. I'm just gonna add clean water to the entire upper part of one wing. This seems a little scary, but just trust me, you can see even on mine, it's not totally dissolving the pattern. It's just gonna soften it. And then I'm gonna put a little bit of that intense blue wash on my brush and I'm gonna dab it along the upper edge of that wing. I'm dabbing it on the upper edge of that wing to give it just a slight blue cast. All right, so it kind of gives it a translucent sort of appearance. And I'm gonna repeat that process to every other part of the wing. So I'm going to add some clean water to the bottom half of that same wing, to the entire bottom half. And then I'm gonna drop in the intense blue wash along the top. Switch to the other side, same thing. Clean water to the upper half of the wing, going over everything. 
And then the intense blue wash along the upper edge, just to add a little cast of blue. And then repeat to the bottom wing. If you're having a hard time keeping up with me today, one thing you could try to do is just do half of what I'm doing because a lot of this is repeated. So you could just do half of the wreath, half of the bee, and then try and do the other side when class is done. But that's our, our bee. And then we'll do the lettering real quick and then we'll just finish up the wreath itself. So for the lettering, this color here is equal amounts of the cadmium yellow and the burnt sienna color. So into the center well, I'm literally just gonna take a scoop of the burnt sienna and a scoop of the cadmium yellow and give it a stir. I'm gonna use that to paint on the lettering. And you can use your two for this, you can use your four for this, whatever size brush you want. I used a four on this one, but I already have the two in my hand. So I'm just gonna keep with the two. And you're just gonna use that color to just paint on the lettering. I might move a little bit slower in real life here to try and get it perfect looking. But due to time, I'm just gonna throw some color on these letters. This is the part where if someone wants to not say be kind, wants to say be happy, they can change the wording inside of that as well. Yeah, that's one I did not throw out as an example. I was like, be bold, be brave, but yeah, be happy would be a great one. So I was gonna to say too, if someone doesn't feel as comfortable as actually like doing the handwriting portion of it, like you're doing there, spelling it out. Feel free to go with the marker as well. And, and, and yes, on there. yes, great idea. Windsor and Newton has great watercolor markers. Michaels also has some watercolor markers and I have a class coming up. I'm not ready to share it yet, but I have a class coming up that will use a watercolor marker for lettering. So that's another great option, Tim. Thank you. Okay, so now we're ready for the chamomile leaves. All right, so for the chamomile leaves, we're gonna use the sap green and then the sap green plus the black in the exact same way we use the black and the gray, where we're not gonna use our water. We're just gonna work in between them by using just the tip of our brush. So literally there's no right or wrong way to do this. I'm gonna start with the sap green and I'm just gonna start painting on some of the leaves on the chamomile leaves and uh, stem. And then every so often, I'm just gonna put the tip of my brush into the other green and I'm gonna paint on another section. All right, and then where those two colors meet, they'll sort of bleed into each other and create sort of a, a middle green between the two. And um, so every time I need to put more paint on my brush, I'm just gonna switch between the greens and I'm just gonna go around and I'm gonna paint on everything. And um, I'm gonna save the buds for the end because we're gonna do something special to the buds. So let's just paint on um, all of the leaves and the stems for now, just working in between both greens. And you may find a number two is a little bit easier to paint these on in a thin way. The two might be a little thick for this, um, but I try to limit the supply list for these classes. Um, so if you have a zero, you could see if a zero works a little bit better for you, but I'm just using the very, very tip of my brush to paint these greens on and just kind of working back and forth between the two. And you know what, if you accidentally grab the sap green, like three times in a row and the sap green plus the black once every, you know, three or four times, that's okay. We just want there to be a little bit of variety in terms of the colors and, and things. So there's no right or wrong way to do this. You can use each color as, as little or as much as you want. In general, I just try and, and, and uh, transfer between them, but sometimes I end up pulling the same color multiple times in a row. All right, so this so is- let, a you know, Mandy, we got, we're five minutes to the hour, but just to let everybody know, we'll continue on with the class until it's done. We have a couple extra minutes afterwards. So if you'd like stick around with us after the hour, and then there's the replay as well. If you're not able to stay with us, you can, check back in it and, and watch it on the replay. Yeah, that sounds great. And I think we'll be pretty good on time. We still have the centers to do of the chamomile and a couple other things, but we're, we're winding up here. The, the longest part of this process is probably the B. So we're getting there. All right. So I'm almost done here with these chamomile leaves. I maybe didn't add as much as what's on the original, but that's okay. It at least adds some color on there. So we're going to focus on the middle now. Uh, actually, wait, sorry, let's do the buds. So to the buds and to the flowers that are just partially opened, I just like to do a few curved lines that sort of follow the curvature of the uh, 
of the bud or of the, the fan looking uh, partially open flower. So I just sort of follow the curvature and just do a few lines using both of the greens just to add a little bit of dimension and color. Uh, so do that to all the buds and to all of those flowers that are just partially open where there's just a series of five leaves that sort of have a fan shape to them. Well, that's what I'm doing. Using both greens, just like I did with the leaves. All right. All right. So that is it for the greenery. And then you can always add more if you wanted when this class is over. So as for the middle of the chamomile flowers, so we have four to do. We have the two front facing and the two side facing. We're going to start with the burnt sienna color and I'm going to load that up on my number two brush. And I'm going to just dab or dot all along the outer edge of that upper right front facing chamomile flower. So all around the outer edge, and then I'm also gonna place a dot of it in the middle. And I'm gonna clean my brush, dab it on my paper towel. We're gonna take a little bit of the cadmium yellow, and then I'm going to dot that on to everything that is remaining on the center that doesn't yet have any color. And I'm gonna allow those two colors to bleed together as they wish. Clean my brush, dab it on my paper towel, and I'm gonna take a little bit of that sap green the green that doesn't have any of the black in it, just the sap green. I'm gonna place a small dot of that in the middle. All right, so it's burnt sienna all along the outer edge in the middle, cadmium yellow to every other white part of the paper, and then a dot of the sap green right in the middle. So that's what you're gonna do to the fruit, two front facing chamomile flowers. To the side view one, it's really not much different. You're gonna take the burnt sienna, dab that on along the base of the middle and right along the upper top middle. All right, and then clean your brush. It'll be the yellow to everything else. Just dab it on. And clean, and then sap green right at the top middle and let that just bleed into everything else. So I'll repeat that to the other two on the other side if you missed it the first time. So I'm gonna dot on burnt sienna along the outer edge and the middle. I'll go ahead and do it to the side view one too, since I still have a lot of paint on my brush. So along the bit, the bottom of the side view one and top middle, clean your brush, dab it on the paper towel, and then cadmium yellow to everything that's left. On both of those. And then take your sap green dot in the middle and dot at the very top of that side view one. All right, so that's how we're doing the centers of the chamomile flowers. And then we just have one more thing to do. Just a nice little finishing touch to kind of tie it all together. We could use the chamomile or just keep the chamomile flowers as they are with the white and then that wash of light gray. But I think it's really nice to do a little bit of that intense blue wash as another shadow color or as like another fold color. And it also ties in what we did to the wings where we added some of that intense blue to the wings. So I'm going to take a little bit of that intense blue wash and same thing. I'm going to start at the base of the petal and just maybe go up it once or twice. And maybe every three or four petals, I may even outline like one outer edge of the petal because white kind of blends into the paper, right? Because we're working on white paper. So I think just outlining the outer edge of a petal here or there uh, just sort of helps those flowers stick out a little bit more, especially when you erase your graphite uh, pencil marks from when you did the outline. Um, but this is not something we want to add like a, a bunch of, like I don't add really more than two um, stripes to each petal because again, I don't want to turn the chamomile flowers blue. I'm just adding a little more shading, um, a little more vibrancy and color uh, just to kind of pull this all together. I hope that makes sense. It's optional, but I, I think it adds a little something special to the piece and we can do it to the bud as well. A little bit to the buds, what's still peeking through the greenery. You can add it to that also. Mandy, how long before it dries when people can take off the eraser and they can go ahead and erase it? How long would you? Yeah, I mean, I usually say an hour just to be on the safe side, but this probably will only take about 30 minutes to dry because we really don't have that many layers of color down. Um, like when we do the other projects I have coming up, 
you'll definitely want to give it an hour, but this one you'd probably be okay after about 30 minutes. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this and we'll maybe hang this uh, somewhere in your house. So near your front door is a good reminder when you leave something to bring a smile to your face. I think it's a really sweet little project. So, and I know I went fast and I know not everyone was able to keep up with me, but I would love to see the work of those of you who, who did paint along with me, even if you're not fully finished and Kelly, I don't know if you'd be willing to spotlight some of those. So you guys will make the recording as well. And also be on the, uh, the video that's uploaded within the next 48 hours. Oh, that looks good. That looks great so far. That B looks awesome. Good job. Oh, look at that B. Wow. You guys rocked the bees. Those look amazing. Good job, Judy. Yes. Oh, very good. Oh, hold that up again. Anita Stahl. Hold that up again so I can see that. Oh, that looks awesome. Oh, your lettering looks great. That looks so good. Well done. So excited to see everybody. Yes. Wow. And Jane, yours looks beautiful. Thank you. I don't, I, I know I won't get to see everyone's, but those that I saw just look fantastic. So let me go ahead and just share my other camera as we um, sort of head off for the day. That looks awesome. Good job, Sandra. I'm so proud of everyone. Oh, just makes my day. So please, like I said, follow me on social media, Mandy Peltier Artist. You can email me from my website, mandypeltier.com. I really hope you will be here on Tuesday for the red, white, and blue anemones class. It'll be really fun. It's a good patriotic project, I think. So um, thanks for being here today, and I hope to see you on Tuesday. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend.